Yeah, welcome everyone to this uh, CMCC webinar. It's a webinar introduced by the Euro Mediterranean Center on Climate Change. My name is Letizia Monteleone and I'm a researcher in the um, risk assessment and adaptation strategies here in uh, ACMCC, um, based in Venice, where also um, we are uh, holding this seminar now. Um, I just want to remind you that this seminar is recorded and will be on the uh, CMCC webpage uh, of the event and also on the YouTube channel. Um, and yeah, so we, the topic of uh, today's webinar is, uh, um, as you can see, the quantified costs of climate change. And our speaker today is Professor Ilan Noy. Um, Professor Noy is a chair in the economics of disasters and climate change uh, at the uh, Victoria University of Wellington and is also the founding and editor-in-chief of the journal Economics for Disaster and Climate Change and is um, uh, teaching and uh, his uh, uh, work focuses on the economic aspects of natural hazards, disasters, uh, climate change and other, other related topics such as uh, environmental developmental economics. Um, so, um, I think I can pass you more, so the floor is yours. I think we have uh, about an hour from the webinar, so you can take okay. time and then we can sure. get questions to the, yeah, after the okay. okay, perfect. And But if anyone has any questions, yes, as we go, by all means, please, um, please ask. Yeah. Okay. And also about this, uh, People on, uh, uh, who are joining online can uh, send their questions in the um, Q&A box in Zoom. Thank you very much for um, coming and also the, um, the people on the Zoom. I assume that they are hearing us, although we didn't ask for verification. Um, okay, so thank you. Um, I assume you haven't seen too many in-person in presentation in the last two years. So I'm excited that I can um, again do in-person presentations and um, hopefully you are too. I'm, the, the, the topic is actually um, related to the quantified cost of climate change. I will clarify in a minute. But first I wanna start with this slide and that that is basically noting that when we talk about the cost of climate change, we usually, focus on two things. We focus either on the increasing in the average temperature, and that's the way we um, model, and we'll talk about that in a minute, that's the way we model the cost of climate change, uh, and that's also the negotiations in the, um, uh, in the UN FCCC, in the, every uh, year when we have the conference of the parties, we're negotiating about 1.5 degrees or 2 degrees or 3 degrees or whatever it is we're negotiating about. So that's one thing we look at, and the other thing is sea level rise. Right? So whenever people talk about climate change, the cost of climate change, they talk about those two things. What I'm going to try and argue here is actually that's not where most of the costs of climate change lie, that we focus on these things because these are the easiest to focus on. So in a sense, we are looking for the keys under the street light instead of where they actually are. Okay, uh, And that's what I'm trying to um, talk about today. And if I manage to change the slides, I will even continue to talk about it. Um, okay, just to give you an example of what I'm saying, when we try to assess the cost of climate change, the, the standard tool, tool we use is the inter, uh, integrated assessment model, which, you know, CMCC is very active in that space as well. Um, and uh, what we do, we have a model of the economy, we have a model of the climate, we connect the two together, and we, um, uh, and we, try to assess the cost of climate change. Typically, that connection between the economy of the, and the climate is based on some kind of damage function. This is an example of, example of the damage function from DICE, possibly the most famous integrated assessment model. And the damage function is the simple, one can say simplistic, uh, oversimplistic um, uh, function. Alpha is the uh, times delta T, delta T is the change the difference between um, temperature pre-industrial to, um, to today. So right now, delta T is about 1.1 degrees, something like that. 
Um, so the damage function dies, as William Nordhaus says, and got the Nobel Prize for it, um, that um, the damage, the global damage, as percent of global um, GDP is, is 0.00236 times 1.1 1 .1 square. That's the damage from that's the damage from climate change, according to uh, William Dorcas. Okay. Um, now, what I would like to argue is actually where we observe now the cost of climate change is not 0.0236 times 1.1 1 .1 square. If we droughts, we have um, storms, storms with um, um, heat waves, um, and with floods, because all of these things are becoming possibly more frequent or more intense, or both, and it's actually it's actually the same thing. Um, and um, all of these things are becoming, at least in some regions, they're becoming more frequent than more intense. Okay, uh, and that's where the cost of climate change is. It's not in the change in the average temperature. It's not in the sea level rise today. Sea level rise will um, create a lot of costs in the future. In the future, but up to now, it hasn't created that much costs. But um, the, the important costs right now. I'm not talking. I'm not trying to project the future. I'm just looking at now. What is the cost of climate change right now? It's in those extreme events. Okay. So just to give you a representation, and it's kind of obvious, but still. Um, if we look at, say, the distribution of temperature, and the distribution of temperature is shifting, right, say by 1.1 degrees, that's the, the mean is shifting by 1.1 uh, degrees, the most important change that this means is that the tails there, the heat waves, are becoming a lot more frequent, okay? So that, that red sort of triangle is how much more frequent those extreme heat waves are becoming, right? Um, so in just this representation, it's maybe, I don't know, six times more frequent. Um, and we start to, to have heat waves, which we haven't experienced before. Okay, that's that little red triangle there. Um, this is even more pronounced if the distribution is not just shifting to the right, it's also flattening, right? If it's flattening, we have even more of an impact on the table. Okay, and we have even more extreme events that we have seen, right? So, is it shifting to the right? In most places, it is. Both precipitation and temperature is shifting to the right. In some places, it's also flattening, right? So, for example, for rainfall in many places, it's both shifting to the right and flattening. So, you also get more extremes. If it's flattening enough, you might also get increases in extremes on the left, right? So, with use of more drafts than you used before, even though the, 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 the curve is shifting to the right. Okay. Okay, so a different way to look at that is say this is, this is a, um, an example of precipitation in a certain location um, without climate change and with climate change, right? I'm colorblind, so I'm not sure the colors here, um, but maybe someone can help me. What's this color? Okay, so the purple is without climate change, the red is with climate change. Okay, so the, the, uh, the thing is shifting to the right. Um, so if this is the threshold that means there is going to be an extreme, wet, extreme rain event, then that sort of slows. Okay. These lines there uh, means what is the total increase in um, the frequency of those extreme rain events uh, because of um, climate change. Okay, so what I'm going to do is use something called extreme event attribution science. Right, extreme event attribution science look at a specific event, a specific event that has already happened. Okay. Say, I don't know what kind of extreme event did you have here in Italy in this past year? Heatwave. Heatwave. Okay, heatwave. Um, heatwave, yes. Uh, so let's say you have a heatwave. Um, you identify, using a climate model, you identify what the probability of that heatwave is. Say it's a one in a hundred heatwave or something like that. So you can pinpoint where that is on this line because we are now on this line, we are on the red line, not on the purple 
done. And then you can think, okay, either you can try and estimate what was the change in the probability of that event, in the frequency of that event because of random change. That's the vertical shift in the curve. Or you can try and estimate what was the horizontal shift, meaning how much more intense that heat wave um, uh, is now because of climate change, right? So the same heat wave that occurred, either you can say, okay, it was more likely because of climate change, or you can say it was more intense because of climate change. It's just basically checking whether the shift, what's the shift here or what's the shift there, right? Questions? No, we're good? Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and talk in, half, in an hour on two papers, about two papers, okay? The first paper is, is this one. Um, that focuses on Hurricane Harvey in 2017 in the US. Um, and I'm going to explain it a little bit. That's joint work with um, Kevin, who is a sociologist. Um, Dave, who is an um, atmospheric physicist. Michael, who is also an atmospheric physicist, and Chris and Ollie, who are both um, hydrological engineers. Okay, so we have six authors, um, five, um, five institutions, and four disciplines in this paper. Okay, what are we doing in this paper? We're looking at Hurricane Harvey. Why are we looking at Hurricane Harvey? Because it was, to quote, a very stable genius. Um, I don't know if you remember him, but hopefully you want to forget him. He used to be the president of the United States. Um, he said that that hurricane was tremendously wet, and he pointed out it was one of the wettest from the standpoint of water. Um, <coughs> I don't think I need to explain that, uh, but he was right. Um, it was water that came from the sky, um, and there was a lot of water that came from the sky. Okay. Um, it actually wasn't a very strong hurricane. It was a category three hurricane, um, but it dropped a lot of water on the city of Houston and caused massive um, flooding. It was the second costliest hurricane in US history, okay? After Hurricane Katrina in um, 2005, okay? Now this, this issue that it wasn't a really strong hurricane, it was an incredibly strong hurricane in terms of the water that it dropped. Um, that's sort of, that's a good example of the mismatch between what the science is doing and what we care about as social scientists. Because hurricanes are ranked by the wind that they generate, right? So category five has a more stronger wind than a category four and so forth. So you categorize them by wind speed. But actually what matters about hurricanes almost universally in all locations is how much water they drop, not how much uh, wind they generate. Um, so if you look at the Philippines, if you look at the South Pacific, if you look at the US, it's almost, the damage is almost always from the rain. It's not from the wind. And there is not a one-to-one -one correlation. So a hurricane, you know, category five does not necessarily generate more rain. Than category three. Actually, this is a good example for that. Anyway, that's a different agenda of trying to convince climate scientists to actually measure what we care about. Um, but uh, that's, that's, we focus on this event because of the rain. The rain is more easily connected to climate change, okay? Because the amount of rain in a hurricane is a function of basically two things, how much moisture there is uh, in the hurricane, and that is determined by the temperature of the ocean over which it passes as it, as it reaches land, okay? Uh, because that's, that's how the moisture is collected in the hurricane. And the other thing that determines how much rain it drops is how fast it is moving. The slower it is moving, the more rain it drops on every location. Right? That seems like obvious, right? Um, and specifically, those two things are related to climate change because the, water, the temperature of the ocean is determined by climate change and the speed in which the hurricane is moving is also because the warmer air means that the hurricane is moving more slow, okay? Um, and colder air, the hurricane moves faster. Don't ask me why, but that's, that's what the atmospheric physicists on this paper say, okay? Okay, so what do we do in this paper? We look at attribution science, um, which I will explain in a minute, and then we connect that to um, hydrological engineering, 
um, so meaning flood mapping, we map the flood in Houston. So we map what actually happened in the flood in Houston. And we also map how the flood would have looked like if there was no climate change, okay? Um, and that means, uh, okay, so we do those two, two mapping of the, uh, of the city of Houston. And then we connect that to socioeconomic data to say something about the distribution of the climate change costs of Hurricane Harvey, okay? So you can divide Hurricane Harvey into the costs that either anyway happened and the costs that are related to climate change. And what we are interested in is the costs that are related to climate change, okay? So to go back to that previous um, figure that I showed you, you can think of attribution as either shift in the frequency or shift in the intensity, okay? In a previous paper that I actually presented here um, some years ago, um, we looked at uh, the frequency change in hurricane. Now we're looking at the intensity change. Okay, it's the, asking the same question, right? If it's the vertical shift or the horizontal shift in the graph. Um, so the, the conclusions from the attribution science was, and, and some of the co-authors on this paper, that's what they have done, um, is that we use a best estimate of 38% of the rain that uh, dropped on the city of Houston was because of climate change, okay? So if there was no climate change, meaning, and I'm, when I say climate change, I mean anthropogenic climate change. So the climate change caused by the fact that we were, um, you know, we put greenhouse gases in the atmosphere in the past 150 years, okay? Um, so 38% of the rain is because of that. Okay, so um, we, we, the paper actually goes to a few other scenarios. So scenarios in which it's less than 20% 20, 20 or 50% or so on. We, we present a bunch of scenarios, but are, we argue the best scenario is 38. And I'm going to show you 38%. Okay, if you want to see all the other results, they're in the paper. Um, okay, so what do we do here? Um, we take, we map, right? The, the upper left corner um, is how the flood looked like in the city of Houston in, in, in the, when the uh, hurricane in, in 2017, okay? And then here we have sort of a minimum contribution of climate change, meaning 7%, only 7% of the region is because of climate change. And then we have, the best estimate of, of climate change, the best estimate of the contribution of climate change, that's what we argue, which is 38% of the rain is because of climate change, right? Now, my friends who see colors say that this is an awful map because the red means good here, meaning no flood, okay? <laughs> um, and typically when we map, um, 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 when you use red, we yeah. sort of scream alert, right? Yeah. So. Bad choice of colors. I didn't make those choice of colors. It's actually the co-authors who do see colors who made those, <laughs> those choices. Um, so don't blame me. And I can, can't even see it, so it's even worse. But um, anyway, now you can, I think, understand the, the map. So you see a lot more red here than, than up there, meaning a lot, of, a lot less would be flooded if there was no climate change. Right? Um, so this map, this describes you the, the flooding in the city if we remove 38% of the rain. Okay. Any questions? The other thing to note about this map um, is that we can, you know, really in detail tell you for every house in the city how much it was flooded and how much it would have flooded without climate change. So take, you know, 10 Main Street where John lives. We can tell you that 10 Main Street had one, one meter of, of rain, and without climate change, it would only have uh, 50 centimeters of, of, of flooding. Right? It didn't, sorry, it didn't have a meter of rain, had a meter of flooding, and without climate change, it would have only had 50 centimeters. There's no one-to-one -one correlation. So when we're removing 38% of the rain, we're not necessarily saying there is 38% less flooding because that depends, that's why we need flood maps, right? 
Uh, so it could be less than 38%, it could be more than 38%. That depends on the topography of the, uh, of the city and how the water uh, flows. Okay. Okay, so what we can do is for every building in the city, and there are actually 1.1 million buildings in the city, houses, homes, um, for every building in the city, we can say what is the attribute, attributable depth of flooding. So how much of the flooding that they experience is because of climate change. We can also say, and I will explain to you in a minute how, we can also say how much the value of the damage that they experience because of climate change for every single house in the city. Um, and we can also say whether that house was flooded because of climate change. So once we remove 38% of the rain, some houses wouldn't have flooded at all. So those houses, we argue, are flooded because of climate change. Okay? So some houses are not flooded at all, with or without climate change. Some houses are um, flooded because of climate change, and some um, houses would have anyway got flooded, but they just flooded more. Okay. We take that and we match that with socioeconomic data. Um, so we have the um, uh, value of each house in the city from the tax, um, um, basically the tax system, because it's taxed. Um, and then we have each uh, house in the city, what kind of house it is, what's the type of construction in the house. So is it a one-story wooden building or is it a three-story brick building and so forth? For each type of house, we have a damage curve. So those damage curves were created by the National Structures Inventory, which is done by the Army Corps, Corps of Engineers. And then those damage curves are say, for a one-story wooden house, if it's flooded by 50 centimeters, there's 30% you know, of the house is damaged. And if it's flooded by a meter, then it's, I don't know, 80%. If it's flooded by two meters, it's 100%. Okay? So that, those are those damage curves. And then we match that with the uh, American Community Survey. That gives us data on ethnicity and average incomes and things like that. Not at the individual level, so we don't know the ethnic identity of each homeowner in the city, but we only have that data aggregated at the census tract, sort of the neighborhood. Okay. So all the results I'm going to present to you after this are not exactly precise, um, but we're focusing on ethnicity and because the neighborhoods are incredibly segregated in the city, it's actually a good proxy because we know, you know, they, some neighborhoods are very Hispanic, some neighborhoods are, are very um, African-American, some neighborhoods are very white and so on. Okay. So if the data was, if, if Houston was not segregated, then we would have had, we would have struggled to say it's anything useful. Luckily, in some sense, it is segregated. Okay. Um, okay. The other, the other last thing I uh, will use is the FEMA, uh, the Federal Emergency Management Authority uh, or agency. Um, flood maps. The flood maps are really bad. Okay. They don't, they're a very good predictor of which house gets flooded. So we're not using that at all. So we don't consider them as good predictors of anything. Um, but, but they are important because if you are in the FEMA flood zone, you are required to buy flood insurance. Okay? And if you are not in the FEMA flood zone, you are not required to buy flood insurance. And typically, if you are not in the FEMA flood zone, you don't buy flood insurance. Flood insurance is both complicated to purchase and um, it's sort of, it's not an automatic add-on to that. Standard insurance is sold by the federal government separately and so forth. It's kind of a complicated system. Um, so what we argue is if you are in the FEMA flood zone, you're likely to have insurance. If you're outside the flood zone, you are, you are likely not to have insurance. So this is just descriptive statistics uh, of the data. Um, so what can we say about the flooding? So about 100,000 houses got flooded. Okay. And if, you know, let's take the best case scenario, which well, no, it's not the best case, but the best estimate that we think of the cost of climate change, that's the 38% scenario. Half of the houses would not have flooded without climate change. Okay. So roughly 55,000 houses 
flooded because of climate change. Okay? Now, all of this basically assumes a sort of a thought experiment that the city of Houston would be exactly the same, but there wouldn't be no climate change, right? That's the counterfactual experiment here, okay? It's not an entirely sensible counterfactual because the city of Houston is built on oil, right? The city of Houston <laughs> wouldn't exist without climate change, right? But we, you know, okay, it, it's, it's somewhat of an illogical counterfactual, but I think still we, we gain something by saying, um, you know, half of the buildings got flooded. Okay, yeah. Do you have any information on the buildings, like the value or characteristics of those buildings, or it's just you only know whether it gets flooded or not? So we have, we, we, well, we model the, the value of each. So we, sorry, we have the tax assets value of the building. So for every building in the city, we have a, the tax assessment because it's tax, right? They have a property tax. So we have the value of each building. And this is, okay. Uh, Sorry, this is an actual tax, not like anything referring to value of the dollars. It's, well, it's a property Italian, tax. Uh, our Italian tax, property taxes are based on values which are up to the other But this is... No, so in Texas, they are, they are assessed, I think, every three or four years, they modify them. Um, so different states in the U.S. have different systems. So in California, for example, the property tax is based on the value of the house when you bought it. Okay. okay? So, so if you bought it for 30 years, you're paying very little tax, right? But if you bought it last year, the same house, you would pay a lot more money. In Texas, it's not like that. They, they, every three years, they update the, the value of the house. Okay? Um, they have a model which is largely based on the you know, most recent transactions in the area, and then that's how they assess the value. Okay? So we have that. And but we we identify this using those damage curves, right? So we know it's flooded by say half a meter. Damage function tells us that half a meter of flooding for this type of building means thirty percent of the, the house is damaged. So we know thirty percent of the known value of the house, and we can we can say the value of the damages, right? Okay. So what you look at when you think of when you look at the value of damages, then Almost 60% of the damages are because of climate change. So 40% are would have anyway happened, and 60% of the damages are because of climate change. So the, the ratio here is slightly more climate change because there it's every house that would have flooded anyway is is the assumes that that's it. But here every house that would have flooded anyway has extra damage because of climate change, right? That's why here it's 60% and there it's only 50%. Okay? You following me? It's good? Okay. Um, that's another way to do the descriptive statistics. So three groups of houses. Houses that weren't flooded, were not flooded at all. Houses that um, did flood, but they flooded just because of climate change. And houses that would have flooded anyway, but had extra flooding because of climate change. And when you look at ethnic composition of those groups, right, you can already see what we're finding. And that is that the Hispanics are overrepresented in those buildings, right? Um, versus the buildings that were not flooded at all. Okay? Um, there isn't a big difference between those two groups, but there is a big difference between those two groups and the A group, meaning not flooded. Okay? There is a more striking, I think, um, difference here, at least from my perspective as an economist. Um, you can divide those houses into those that flooded um, and were inside the flood zone and those that were outside the flood zone. Okay? That's basically a proxy for they, whether they had insurance or not. Okay? In, if you happen to see the published version of the paper once it gets published, so it was accepted, but hasn't been published yet, um, the referee forced us to remove that paper because the referee was a sociologist and for him, or her, actually him probably, because he was really insistent, um, stubborn. Um, for him, yeah, let's, let's assume it's him, uh, for him, um, 
we, we try to argue that this is a good proxy for being insured or not, whether you are in the flood zone, because you have to buy flood insurance if you're in the flood zone. You don't have to buy it if you are outside the flood zone. Uh, but he said, yeah, but there are some properties here don't buy insurance, and some properties there do buy insurance, which is true. But it's still a good, it's still a good proxy. He wasn't comfortable with that, so we had to remove that. Um, okay. Uh, and remove any mention of insurance from the paper. Um, anyway, at least I, there's still freedom of speech, so I can still uh, <laughs> talk about it. Um, okay, so that's a, a proxy for insurance. So once you look at the sort of, these are the, the percentage, there are, are percentages for, for Spanish. Um, and you can see that the bias, and I'm sorry, saying bias in the sense that the hurricane was biased against the Hispanics. Of course, the hurricane itself could care less about the ethnicity of the people underneath it. But, um, but in the way that the hurricane damages were distributed, um, there is a the clear bias is there in the uninsured group. It's not here in the insured group, it's in the, in the uninsured group. Okay. Um, okay, and that's a big difference. 10 percentage uh, points is really, really big. Okay, you can do the same kind of analysis with regressions, but you already know what will be fine. Um, and that is that once you look at the, um, the proportion Latinx in the neighborhood, that's strongly um, um, uh, positive and, and significant. So meaning if there is a lot of Hispanics in the neighborhood, you're much more likely to get flooded because of climate change. And equally, I don't, so this, this, this is for like um, uh, sorry. This is for the um, the, the amount of depth, the depth of damage because of climate change, and so that's the left hand side variable there. In the left hand side variable here, it's the amount of damage in dollar terms because of climate change. Okay, uh, I don't know why I don't see that at the top. Um, okay, but in in each case, the proportion Latinx is. Um, um, and then when you interact that with so uh, something else I'm not sure if you see here, um, but income income here is positive and significant, meaning higher income more likely to get flooded. Okay. That's different, for example, with Hurricane Katrina, where in Hurricane Katrina, is, it's the lower income neighborhoods that got flooded. Okay. In the case of Houston, it's, it's higher income neighborhoods that gets flooded, but that relationship is reversed for the Latinx population. So for the Latinx or Hispanic population, um, Latinx is sort of the more PC term to use for, for, for Hispanic today. Right? Um, in, there's a whole lot of literature about whether Latinx is the right proper term to use or not. There's no argument about that. But get into that. Um, and a lot of Hispanics are not happy with this, including my wife, who is also Mexican, um, incidentally. But um, the, the, the point here is that the relationship for Latinx reverses in terms of income. Okay, so just a different way to look at, at that. Okay. These are the low-income neighborhoods. The more la the more la the more Hispanics are in that in those neighborhoods, the higher the probability that they will get flooded because of climate change. Okay. But for the high-income neighborhoods, the relationship with with uh, the Hispanics is reversed. So the more Hispanics are in the neighborhood, the lower uh, the, the likelihood that they will get uh, flooded because of climate change. Okay, so what do we find? Neighborhoods with more Hispanics um, have more um, climate change attributed flooding. Neighborhoods with higher incomes have more climate change attributed flooding. But the, for, for uh, the, the Hispanics, it's the low income Hispanic neighborhoods that have. Um, more climate change attributed flooding. And specifically, it's the low income 
uninsured Hispanic population that had them disproportionately by far the most climate change attribute of climate. Okay. So what we're doing in this paper is we're just describing this pattern, right? We're not explaining this pattern. Okay. Um, we have two hypotheses on why we observe this pattern. Okay. One is um, because there's a lot of puzzling things, right? For, for example, and I didn't talk about that, it's, it's not the, the bias is not against African Americans. While in many cases, including Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans, there was a clear bias. The hurricane was biased against African Americans. That's not the case in this, in, in this um, instance. And it's actually, we expected when we started the analysis, we expected to show also bias against African Americans, but it's not there. It's not in the data, okay? Um, so we have sort of two explanations. One is um, with, the, with the Latin population, you have two groups. You have the Mexicans who have been there, well, actually before the whites, because Texas used to be Mexico, right? So you have a very old uh, Hispanic population, and you have a very new, newly arrived Hispanic population. That's all the, the recent immigrants, okay? Now, typically, the, the newest newcomers are settling in the least safest area. That's generally a pattern almost anywhere in the world, right? So if you look at urban sort of spatial distribution of, of populations, people don't want to sit in the areas that there is high risk, so it's the newcomers who are being there. So it's that newcomer, poorer Hispanic population that is settling in those um, risky uh, areas. And the African-Americans, because, because they came earlier, then the, the, these new immigrants are actually in safer areas. Um, the other possible explanation is something around investment in uh, drainage, storm drain infrastructure. And there is potentially a bias against immigrants and, and you know, immigrant communities and so forth. We are looking for data that will support these two, you know, that we well, might confirm or actually disprove those two hypotheses, but we haven't, we're not there yet. Yeah. You know, when you want to control for that, like by income in the US, municipalities are in charge of, of, let's say, drainage and so on, and they get their funding from taxes. So, long term neighborhoods are likely to have no tax base. Um, so, this is one county, Harris County. Not quite huge. Right? right. So, I think that funding is by the county. I don't know about Texas specifically, but a lot of funding in the US is by county rather than by municipality, right? And this is only one county. It's a huge county. So there's there's no easily easy there's not an easy proxy for the distribution of investment within the county. Okay. One, one way would be to can find information on housing associations who force people to put their dreams and practice right? but I don't know. Yeah, I don't know if that. So we're looking, um, Kevin is looking for data. And we're actually looking for, you know, investment by the, by the city in, in drainage infrastructure. Because, you know, all of that information in principle should be public. Um, so he's looking for that data uh, and, you know, doing information requests to the city and so forth. Um, right now, we don't have anything. Uh, is flooding essentially a drainage uh, problem or connected to some water bodies? So there are water bodies. Um, the flooding was surface flooding. So it's not, it wasn't fluvial flooding. It okay. wasn't the river that, that um, so it was surface flooding. A lot of that, that had to do with, you know, drainage that was either not sufficient or not maintained. Uh, a lot of it had to do with the with the kind of um, lack of zoning policies, so they paved a lot of they they paved a lot of stuff. So so the ground is now while it used to be able to um, you know to hold a lot more water now because a lot of it is paved, it's not okay. So all of these issues around drainage, around pavement, pavement, and so forth, so impenetrable surfaces, surfaces and so forth, are all related to, to the kind of flow. So because we have in Europe the contradictory image that um, many wealthy households are at risk of flooding because they live in some rank areas. 
Yes. 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 So some of that also exists there because there are bodies of water. So there are canals there, and that's why we have this this positive association between income and flooding in Houston, right? So there is an amenity value, but though that amenity value is for this group. Because they're in the flood zone, right? They're near bodies of water, and that means that they're in the flood zone. Because the way the flood zones are being mapped, that's part of the problem, they're only mapping fluvial flooding rather than fluvial flooding. Right? So they're only mapping, FEMA only maps um, flooding associated with um, bodies of water rather than surface flooding. And then all, all, only maps 100 year flood. Yes. But I think the big, the, the, the big issue in, in the city of Houston, which, which meant that 75% of the houses that flooded were outside the FEMA flood zone, um, is, is not so much because, because of the limit of the 100 year definition, but because it was surface flooding, it wasn't. It wasn't fluvial flooding. Okay, um, or most of it was. Okay, um, the other paper. The other paper is going to be shorter, so we have fifteen minutes. I think so. Good. Um, yeah, maybe if we could miss some time. Again, sure, and, and I'm happy to ask, stay after that to talk to anyone who yeah. wants to. Talk, right? I'm, I'm not in a hurry to go anywhere. Um, so the second paper tries to do something else, and that is actually, instead of looking at a very specific event like Hurricane Harvey, we're looking globally. So we're trying to assess all the climate change attributed costs of extreme weather globally. Um, and that's, that's work with Rebecca Newman, who is at the Reserve Bank of New Zealand. Okay, so here we are looking at the other sort of perspective, the intensity frequency perspective rather than the intensity perspective. In the frequency perspective, you, you get this, um, what they do in the attribution literature is they produce this metric called the FAR, the fraction of attributable risk. So what's the fraction of the risk of that event happening that is associated with climate change? So take an event where in the natural world was in, you know, one in 50, right? A 50 year event, and then it becomes a one in 10 year because of climate change, okay? That's a very likely shift, actually. Um, and that means that 80%, just the, the calculation of the, the FAR, the fraction of attributable risk, 80% of the likelihood of the event is because of climate change, okay? If it is now one in 10 rather than one in 50, okay? This is, um, this is something set that you do, so you can calculate. We, we didn't calculate, so that's the standard way they approach this, right? They, they, they look at specific events and they calculate what was the probability of that event happening in the natural world. Yes. What is the probability of that event happening in today, in this world where we have climate change? And they, they, then they calculate the FAR according to this calculation, right? Mm -hmm. So they look at the heat wave in Italy yeah. um, and they say, okay, Without climate change, that would have been a one in 200 year event, and now it's a one in 100 year event. That means that 50% of the likelihood of that event is because of climate change. Okay? So, it's like, uh, it's, oh, well, yeah. so it's, 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 now, so what you have here, um, I, I'll get to that point in a second because I'm going to show you some examples of specific events. Um, you take that metric, the FAR, and you multiply that by the cost of the event. And if you aggregate that over a large number of events, you can argue, okay, that's a good proxy for the cost of climate change for extreme weather events, okay? Um, so if the fire of a specific event is 0 0.8 and its economic cost is $100,000, then you can argue that $80,000 of that event are because of climate change, okay? So what do we do? We look at all the attribution studies that were done, um, we find about 250 papers. So this is kind of a meta-analysis situation, right? Um, 
we find 250 papers around that were um, that focused on attribution of specific weather events. Um, they actually looked at the 179 events. Okay. Um, and we, for those 179 events, we find the economic costs of those events, actually the damages from that event. Okay. We start with the end data, which you might be from, familiar with, um, and which looks at the costs of you know, extreme weather. Um, and then we, if, if end that doesn't have information about that event, then we try to find other alternative sources of information. So it might be government agencies, it might be aid organizations, it might be the World Bank or whatever. Um, and then we, we match the two, right? So for each event that, for which we have a FAR, we find the economic cost of that event uh, and we, we match them. It, it needs to be matched both in time and in the geographical coverage because a FAR, that those calculations of this fraction of attributable risk is for a specific so say there is a heat wave in Europe, right? You can't, they, they calculated FAR for that heat wave in Italy might be very different than the same heat wave, the same, you know, three days in June um, for France. Okay, even both of them are experiencing the same kind of event, that heat wave, the calculation of the FAR is dependent on, on the location. So we need to match the calculation of the FAR to the economic cost metric. So what's the cost of that heat for Italy if we have a FAR for Italy, okay? And once we, we match that, we can say something about the cost. That's just an example. So let's focus on maybe one example. That heat waves. So for all these studies on heat waves, the average FAR that they find is 0 0.77. So 77% of the likelihood of heat waves those that were um, um, in those attribution studies is because of climate change. So you are not terribly surprised, I'm sure, to know that heat waves are the most likely extreme weather events that is becoming more frequent because of climate change, right? Some other types of extreme events, for, for example, flooding, ah, just one more point to note here, note that there is, uh, there is some um, heat wave event that has a far of one. Okay, a far of one means it would not have happened at all without climate change. Okay, there was actually a heat wave like that last year in the Northwest United States, um, in Oregon and Washington and British Columbia, where the climate scientists said, I think those in some places in Oregon, it rec recorded uh, temperatures that were seven degrees Celsius higher than ever recorded in that spot. So when you suddenly jump seven, seven degrees higher, that means there's something unusual, right? So the climate scientist said this event was virtually impossible. Okay, and they what they define as virtually impossible it was less than one in ten thousand years uh, without climate change. Okay, that's the definition of virtually impossible. Okay, so some events, some heat waves are like that, um, but when you look at flooding, for example. A, the average assessment is just 0 0.2, so only 20% of the likelihood of flooding is because of climate change. And there is much more variety. So actually some places have negative cause, meaning those floodings, that those flood events are becoming less likely um, with climate change. Okay, so some places in the world are becoming drier, and they're not. Their flooding is becoming less likely in some locations. In some locations, it's becoming much more likely. So that depends on the location. Um, you can see that cold waves, cold events are becoming less likely because of climate change. Okay? Not terribly surprising, but that's the case. Again, not true everywhere, right? There are some places where they're experiencing more cold events because of climate change. So it depends on both the shifting of the distribution and how more flat it is becoming, okay? Okay, so I think I have only two more slides or three. So this describes to you the, um, the overall cost of climate change just in terms of extreme weather events. So there's a whole host of other costs of climate change, right? Ocean acidification, um, sea level rise, uh, 
environmental degradation, ecosystem collapse, all of these other things. This is just trying to call, quantify the extreme weather event costs of climate change. Okay, and that's as percent of global GDP. Okay, so in the past twenty years, so in the past twenty years, as percent of global GDP, that describes to you the uh, the cost of climate change. If you want to know a dollar figure, the average is one hundred and fifty billion dollars a year. Okay, is annual globally? average globally. Globally. Um, Whenever you see a number with a lot of zeros, you need to ask, is it a big one or not, right? Um, well, it's a big one against when you compare it to my bank account, that's clear. But uh, is it big in the sense that globally it means something? Well, it is, because if you look, for example, at the COPs, at the negotiations in the COP every year, or the last one in Glasgow, uh, the negotiations was, will we pay $100 billion a year um, for, for uh, both mitigation and adaptation. And what we're saying is only the adaptation part and only the adaptation to extreme weather events should be $150 billion already. Okay, that suggests a very high cost, I think. Um, okay, another sort of exercise, I think, an interesting one, is to compare our predictions versus what the integrated assessment model is. So we take the dice. Why dice? Because, I don't know, because it's a Nobel Prize, so it's easier to um, uh, attack a Nobel Prize winner. Um, so the dark, the dark bars is what dice is predicting for the cost of extreme weather events and environmental degradation, degradation together. Okay, so for them, the, the cost of both of these together is the dark bars, and the light bars is what we are still showing is just extreme weather event costs. Okay, so in some sense, we are winning. Um, it's a bit much higher, right? The integrated assessment model is underestimating the cost of climate change. That seems to be an obvious point. Uh, at least this one. Now, we also did the comparison with fund. It's another sort of popular integrated assessment model. Um, the gap is not as big as with DICE, but still, um, we, our predictions are much higher than the, uh, the fund, I think by a factor of three or four. Okay. Okay, one last uh, point. This, these papers, um, the two papers I mentioned, and we have two others. Um, this is the first time that anyone is looking at that attribution um, research in the science, in the climate science, and matching that with economic data. Okay. Um, so we sort of have an agenda of saying, okay, this attribution literature exists. Let's use that with economic data to say something meaningful. Okay. Um, and yeah, and those papers were sort of three and four in that agenda. Um, we have ideas for other papers, right? So one example is, uh, I don't know if you wanted to be reminded of these two, but um, um, FEMA provided aid to assistance to uh, the Hurricane Harvey flood victims, right? So what we're doing now is we're collecting the data from FEMA on how the aid was distributed. Um, so that's public information. Um, and we can then identify, first of all, what is the share of the FEMA spending that was associated with climate change? Um, and B, what are the biases in that uh, distribution of uh, FEMA uh, flooding? So you wouldn't be surprised to know that there is both a bias in terms of hurricane damages and also in terms of where the FEMA money went. So the FEMA, if you are white, you are much more likely than if you are um, in, in Houston, okay? Um, and we are just now sort of doing those calculations. We already have the results, but we haven't written the paper yet. Um, another sort of use of this idea is to try and see whether that convincing communication tool to communicate with people about the climate 
uh, climate change. Because in principle, we can send a letter to John who lives in 10 Main Street and tell him, because of climate change, you had $20,000 of damages to your house, right? And, you know, so on for each house in the city, okay? So is that a useful sort of communication device to talk about climate change? In Texas, a lot of people don't believe climate change. It's really, right? um, so can we convince them that it's really, if we tell them that their house, they have $20,000 of damages, okay? We're not exactly yet sure how we will do this work and how exactly this research will do, will happen, and we need to think about the ethics of it, and things like that. Kind of complicated, but we see that's an, an agenda we are uh, hoping to develop. Um, and I think there's a lot of other questions with this kind of sort of approach. Take the attribution science stuff and take economic questions and data and, and, and marry the two together. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Uh, questions? Yeah. We, there are some? Okay. If we have some online, maybe yeah, can read them to you. Sure. Um, so, do you think this analysis uh, could be used to estimate the social carbon cost? Um, no, because we are only analyzing one part of the cost of climate change. So we need, if we can, if we can quantify all the other costs. Of, so here we are starting sort of, we call this the bottom-up approach to climate change cost assessment versus the, the top-down approach of the integrated assessment models, right? I don't think that this is an alternative to the but what it can do is inform the integrated assessment model so they place a lot bigger weight mm -hmm. on the cost of extreme weather events. Okay? Because part of the problem, I think, with the integrated assessment models, they're estimating, underestimating the that component mm -hmm. of, um, um, of the climate change costs. So you, you still need some form of an integrated assessment model in order to to the social cost of carbon, or develop some other methods to quantify to quantify all the other costs of climate change, other than Just a follow up on this. It's true that this is only a tiny part of the It's not a tiny. No, it's I mean, a big piece. So. We don't know. Okay, we don't know because we haven't quantified. Right, right. So you could actually compute the social cost of. Uh, like extremes. Sure, sure. But that, if, if, yes. what, if what you're looking at is the social cost of carbon, so that that's a metric that's used by government, for example, yeah, no, no, as no, no, no. policy, you need to account for everything else. Yeah. Right? Still yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, I'm not an integrated model. My one reason be that it is integrated more, uh, models have difficulties in assessing costs of urban urban areas. Mm -hmm. um, this this is the this doesn't assess the cost of the right? that's the integrated assessment model, right? And you know, some integrated assessment models have a more sophisticated data structure, but it's not terribly more sophisticated, right? So it might have changing the temperature by region rather than just the global average temperature, and it might have some something about the second, I don't think they have um, any, any of them has anything about the third moment in the, the change in the average um, temperature. Um, so they are incredibly simplistic and they definitely, I mean, if, if in the urban area you're talking about extreme weather, yeah, they're not accounting that at all. There might be other issues around urban areas that are not related to extreme weather. Right? Um, I don't know what you would be referring to. What's that? Energy right. Um, yeah, that, that would be. Yeah. You think that the real part of cost, the economic cost to be used in the formula, is by country and by uh, type of data, and also which kind of variables we use? Is it based on size of the literature? Can you elaborate more on this? Yeah, sure. So, 
what we do, we have 179 events for which we have a FAR mm -hmm. and have a cost. So we multiply that. And, um, sorry. So for those 179 events are only a subset of all the events that happened in those last 20 years. For most of them, we don't have a calculation of the FAR. We do have a calculation of the cost. Okay, so we only look at those events in MDAT, all the events in MDAT, basically. Okay? And we use the cost in MDAT. Okay. okay, now the question is for all the, I don't know, a few thousand events that happened in the last 20 years in the world, for most of them, we don't have a FAR. Okay, so what we do is we take the FAR by type and by region. So, say all the heat waves in North America, okay, we have some number of studies of heat waves in North America. We average the FAR in those and apply that FAR for all other heat waves in North America. And the same we do for flooding in Europe and, you know, cold, cold well, snaps in sub Saharan Africa. Actually, they don't happen. They don't happen in sub Saharan Africa. It's in North America. Okay. Um, and, and that's how we do it. Right. Now, I wouldn't, in principle, we can then say by country and things like that. Okay, we can say what is the cost per, for each country. We're not really comfortable with that because um, we don't have enough observations of FAR in each country to really be co convenient, convinced that this is a reliable um, metric per country. And that's why we only show the globe, uh, the world, the world aggregate. And we show by um, high income and low income countries, or middle and low income countries. So just separate high income countries versus um, middle income countries, uh, middle and low income countries. Okay, we're not, we don't think that this is precise enough to, to do this by, uh, by country, because to some extent, it's also a function of the type of events, extreme events that happened in the last 20 years. And there's a randomness in that. Right? So once you aggregate globally, maybe that randomness is not that big a deal. But once you try to, to produce this for, for country, then you know some country were just had bad luck in the last 20 years and some others did. Okay, so it's not reliable uh, to do um, that. In an ideal world, we had we would have had FARs for every, all of these things. And then, then we could do it, but we don't. Or then we could do more precise uh, work. The cost that I saw it. Uh, is that on the stock or it is a stock or a flow? The cost it's a stock. It's, a stock. it's from MDAT. Okay. So what MDAT is producing is the stock of damages. Okay. Um, MDAT is a bit vague yes. about what they collect. Uh, I don't know how many of you worked with MDAT. Mm -hmm. uh, but it is a bit, it's not like exactly what they collect. It's also self-damages. It's not necessarily self-reported. So the UN best inventor data is self-reported by the country. Um, and that say that they collect the best data that they can get, and that might be self-reported from the government. It might be, you know, a UN agency, UN, UN you know, DFI, uh, not DFI, uh, UNDP, or the World Bank that does a post-disaster need assessment, or it could be a media report. Which, which, yeah. which is arguably worse, and they're not clear about exactly where they get their data. But they, the best case that's what we have, so there's nothing better than, than I can do. I, I can talk for hours about why MDAT is not a perfect database. Um, and I've talked with actually with Debbie, who runs the place, uh, about that at length, but you know, that's the best we have. Thank you. Any other? Yes. Was there anything else? Um, one just came in about the. Uh, so, your estimate of um, uh, cost of 150 billion um, US. And uh, I think that you mentioned about the, of the laws of the and COP negotiations. And the question is. Um, if you have a rough estimate of the global goal, would you think it should be um, saying that the cost is much higher? If I have an estimate of what? For adaptation and climate crisis. 
it should be much higher. But I mean, I mean the, the discussion was about $100 billion, and none of that was delivered. So the amount that was actually delivered was a lot less than $100 billion. So it seems, in some sense, immaterial if I say, no, it shouldn't be $100 billion, it should be $150 billion, or it should be $200 billion, because we're not even reaching $100 billion. Um, but my argument would be it should be 150 billion just for extreme weather events, for adaptation to extreme weather events. Okay? Yeah. Not even adaptation, because adaptation is also forward looking in terms of reducing the risk. It's, um, it's just about compensation, even though compensation is not a popular uh, word in the climate negotiations. Um, so, what we call the damage and loss, the damage and loss. Um, Okay. Damage and, and loss, the commitment on damage and loss should be 150 million per year. That would be okay. Um, so, um, there is another question on the file that maybe we have partially already answered, but uh, I'll pose it again. Um, so, uh, I was asking about, so, since the probability of a given event in climate change world is difficult to assess because of the tail problem, how can far be reliable? Okay, so that, that's, that's an argument within climate science. I'm not a climate scientist, mm -hmm. but the attribution stuff is an established practice in climate science. Mm -hmm. And it started in 2003 in the paper by Miles Ellen in Nature. Um, and since about 2011 or something like that, it really took off. There is, a, there is an annual issue of the Bulletin of the American Meteorological Society, the BANS, uh, which is published on attribution studies. They just publish attribution studies. And in 2012, it was, had maybe 10 papers. Now it has, I don't know, 50 papers per year or something like that. Um, and you know, that's what they do. That's exactly what they're doing, right? Trying to pinpoint the, that, that point in the tail. So they're not trying to model the whole tail. They're just trying to point to pinpoint a specific point on that tail that corresponds for a specific weather event. Okay, so in some sense, it's less ambitious mm -hmm. than trying to model the shift in the whole tail. Okay, and, you know, some people in climate science say they don't believe this attribution stuff. Others, are saying this is, you know, a very valid exercise. They publish, you know, 179 papers. We only used papers that were published in referee journals. Um, and if we had multiple papers um, which um, focused on the same event, we only used the one that was published in the most prestigious um, journal. And, you know, they're publishing in science, in nature, in all of this stuff. So. Because there are still criticism of that. There is an active research agenda there, but it's not my research agenda. Right? I'm an economist. Um, but they say, you know, the, the people who do this um, say it's a reliable method. Um, there is also something called the World Attribution Network. It's run by Freddie Otto from University College London. Um, and what she's doing and, and her group is doing is they're looking at events that just happened and are trying to produce a fast estimate of that FAR um, for that event. So typically, they, there's, they, I think in the network, they have about 50 scientists or something like that. And then if there is a big event, they sort of collect together um, and work on that. And it typically takes them, about, usually there are about 20 who work on this. And it takes them two, three weeks to produce this. So this is not something that they just do like that. Okay, this is serious research um, to, to get to those. And that's, for example, the heat wave in, in North America that I mentioned. You know, it took them about a month, I think, to produce that information that said this would have been virtually impossible. So I trust them because, you know, I mean, I'm not qualified to not trust them. And if the literature is been published by very, very good, in very, very good journals. <laughs> it's fine with me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe, oh, 
I have just a curiosity of a question. Um, so this, uh, this project we're working on receipt um, is, uh, so we're trying to do just also like while we start the conversation, but uh, um, uh, try to uh, kind of calculate the impact of uh, uh, some extreme weather events uh, in developing countries to um, try to map the connection uh, of these impacts to Europe. I was wondering if you have any, because I guess it would be great to uh, uh, see what methodology you use, but I see some challenges in the data. Uh, or uh, So I wonder if you have any experience when you publish anything with developing countries that you're thinking to explore the research in that sense. And uh, yeah. With this, with attribution. Yes. Um, so there is a problem. Um, a lot of the FAR studies, um, so that, that attribution stuff is on North America and Europe. Um, because the funding is coming from North America and Europe and the mm. scientists are there. So there's not and that. And the necessary data is, yeah. is more available there, more easily accessible, more available. So, um, so there is a, there is a dearth of um, information about, um, you know, those extreme weather events in, in developing countries. And specifically what I'm interested in is that climate change part of those mm -hmm. extreme weather events. So if we just want to know the cost of these extreme weather events, and that does have that, whether and that is reliable or not, and maybe it's less reliable in developing countries, that might be the case. Um, but attribution, is, so actually there is, um, I can give you a good example. Um, um, tropical cyclone Idai that hit uh, Malawi and Mozambique yes. in 2019. It was a very, very big event. Um, actually, I think that the strongest tropical cyclone to hit Sub Saharan Africa for quite some time. Um, and I have, I'm working with some people at the World Bank with, and we have very good household level survey um, in uh, Malawi, in the region that was hit from before the tropical cycle and then from after the uh, tropical cycle, okay? So I wanted to take that information and connect that to an attribution study of Hurricane on tropical cycle of Hidai, um, to say something about climate change and, and the impact on households because I know what the impact on households was because we have the survey, mm -hmm. okay? Um, I couldn't find it. Yeah. There is no attribution study on, on uh, uh, tropical cycle of Hidai. Yeah. And um, and I tried to convince a few groups um, to do that. So I talked to a group in Columbia University. I talked to a group in Princeton, um, and um, they were like, mm, "Not interested." Um, why not interested? And they say we don't know the data. We don't have the data, and so forth. And so all these reasons. They don't know data. Yeah. So I some... remember when we were starting discussing on climate change adaptation and so on in Italy in the, some more than fifteen years ago or so. We were honest, uh, complaining about not having consistent long time frame, uh, timelines of temperatures and uh, atmospheric data. Imagine in Italy, if it's, uh, it's the case here, uh, what is it? Imagine in Malawi, in Malawi, sure. Oh, sure. Oh, oh, but usually we do have it. Yeah. Yeah. No, but I was talking about 18th century data. Yeah, yeah, we're talking yeah. about time, time notes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And it was yeah. a Right, and in yeah. some of those countries, actually, there is better older data. Right, so, um, so in British colonies, for countries that were British colonies, the British were actually pretty good at collecting temperature data and things like that. But then, sadly, after that, those practices have sort of um, we have stop. a lot of uh, reconstruction data from Chapman slots, right? Those have been like But um, yeah, but those are sort of more and not systematically distributed. Yeah, Hawkins has a great project where they're 
presentation then yes um written logs and stuff has to make them just expand it a number of different yeah and, and there is um there's similarly for um hurricane tracks um there's a project that tries to because with the record for hurricanes or tropical cyclones, whatever you want to call it, um, the reliable data is only from 1980 or something like that. So now they're trying to reconstruct those backward to the 19th century using those ship laws. But those are sort of random because, you know, if there happened to be a ship where the ship, you know, the captain kept a good log and it's still publicly available or still available somewhere in some archive, then you can do that. But if the ship didn't move there, then in Bangladesh, we were constructing using grain distribution. Mm -hmm. so after every major natural disaster, which we have a lot, sure. there is a government outlay of grains from yes. the source. So that's how we have been handled. Yeah, but that would then be insert a different type of, of noise into that data because the distribution is not necessarily 100% correlated with the damages and so forth. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. Right. So, yeah, I think uh, if nobody else has any questions, we can close this. And uh, thank, you but thank you very much for uh, and the discussion. Very interesting. I remind just people online that the webinar will be uh, recorded on and uh, saved on the CNCC webpage and YouTube. And also that, uh, yeah, um, next week we will have um, a webinar on Tuesday uh, on coastal flooding use displacement caused by Cyclone Eli has. Um, and yeah, thank you and see you soon. Thank you for all of those online. Also. <laughs>